One of the first truly great examples of trickery in the art of warfare can be found in Homer's Iliad. Thousands of years ago, Homer wrote of the large wooden horse and the 100 mighty Greek warriors who hid themselves in its belly and then attacked and destroyed Troy after the Trojans foolishly accepted the horse as a gift. In the almost 3,000 years since Homer wrote, the role of trickery in warfare has not diminished. The American Civil War was no different. In the early months after the war, as the armies jostled for position in northern Virginia after the first battle at Manassas, and as the leaders of the forces were being placed upon the chessboard, two key figures emerged in the opposing armies. And though both of these men were West Pointers, they each had a different style of leadership and quite different ways of accomplishing warfare. James Ewell Brown Stewart, ubiquitously called Jeb Stewart, was not so much handsome as he was dashing. He was a Cavalier's Cavalier, and when called to action, he was as likely to overact as he was to stay on task. Jeb Stewart could turn a reconnaissance trip into a cross-country tour. Stewart was brave, certainly, and smart as well. After the Battle of Manassas in July of 1861, Lines were drawn to keep the Federal forces from pushing into Virginia and to prevent the Confederate Army from marching on Washington. One of those lines was drawn between Munson's Hill and Bailey's Crossroads in eastern Fairfax County, Virginia. Jeb Stewart's job was to make sure the Union Army didn't advance across the Rebel lines, and in full view of the Federal soldiers, he occupied Munson's Hill a vista from which Stuart had an eyeful of Washington. Also, he appeared to have sufficient artillery to sustain a Union assault. After the Manassas fiasco, George McClellan became the newly appointed commander of the Division of the Potomac. McClellan, close to 35 years old in late 1861, had a problem. George McClellan believed firmly that one should not enter battle unless one's numbers were overwhelmingly on the side of winning. McClellan was beloved by his men, but he was not seen in the same light by those in Washington, D.C. He was thought slow to act. He was also demanding. Men, supplies, time, when prevailed upon to attack, McClellan always had reasons why he should not move outward from Washington to take on the Confederate forces. Therefore, having seen the fortifications atop Munson's Hill, just a scant few miles from the Potomac, General George McClellan had yet another reason to stay put until he felt he had a number of troops substantially greater than what he had. Simply put, McClellan was not a risk taker. Imagine then the surprise to all when the Confederate forces ensconced atop Munson's Hill abandoned their position, as well as visible artillery, on the morning of September 28, 1861. And what did the Union soldiers find when they took the hill after the Rebs' departure? Quaker guns. Guns made out of wood and old wagon wheels. Guns which were not guns at all, but merely theatrical pieces made to look hostile. They were called Quaker guns because traditional Quakers were pacifists and not warlike, just like these simulated cannon. In the two months and one week since the Battle of Manassas, the Union Army had been kept in place, at least in this little field of Northern Virginia, by so many harmless sections of tree trunks and archaic wagon parts. Sadly, for General George B. McClellan, this would not be the last time the Confederate Army would pull such wool over his eyes, and the non-weapons of Munson's Hill would give many of McClellan's detractors some ammunition to use against him. But both McClellan and his southern counterpart, Jeb Stuart, would live to fight, really fight, with real weapons another day.